Okay, it's a pleasure to uh, be talking to you, uh, even if I am remotely uh, from across the globe. Uh, it's uh, great to be up at 5.30 in the morning talking about physics, and I hope I'm not keeping you all from your dinner, but you might have to eat at uh, 7 p.m. instead. So uh, my assignment is to talk about SUSY models, theory and phenol, and in particular, what that means is in part one of the talk, the first hour will be uh, mainly on naturalness uh, and the uh, mu problem, which you rarely hear about. I'll go over a lot of old favorites of models and uh, briefly about G minus two of the muon. And then in part two, I wanna address uh, what string theory has to say. Um, the latest is uh, the string theory landscape, which developed over the last 20 years and that makes particular predictions for supersymmetry and how it also addresses what's called the SUSY flavor and CP problem. And then I'll talk about uh, LHC searches. And if there's any time left, I'll talk about dark matter and baryogenesis briefly. But uh, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, the whole deal here is to uh, point uh, my experimental colleagues in the direction of hunting supersymmetry at high Lumi LHC, which is going to be the uh, main game in town for the next 10 years. So here, uh, my, the bulk of my talk has twin pillars of guidance, naturalness, and simplicity. Einstein said everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And in our context, that means that the uh, Standard model is our starting point because that uh, describes nature as we know it right now. But Weinberg uh, insists that the appearance of fine tuning in a scientific theory is like a cry of distress from nature complaining that something needs to be better explained. And we'll see that the standard model has at least two fine tuning issues, which we'd like to address. Let me see if my... Uh, I'm pushing my button here, but it doesn't want to advance the slides. I may have to flip back to uh, non-full screen mode, or okay. I could reshare. Yeah, maybe you can. Let me uh, try this. Yeah. Yes. Is okay, it? now it's, yeah, uh, it's advancing. Working. So our starting point is a standard model. Everybody knows the gauge symmetry is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 with three generations of quarks and leptons. And we invoke a Higgs sector in order to accommodate spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking. <clears throat> Under spontaneous symmetry breaking, we gain a massive W and Z and a massless photon along with massive quarks and leptons and a physical scalar called the Higgs. The complete Lagrangian contains 19 parameters uh, plus extra neutrino sector parameters. And this gives a good to excellent description of almost all accelerator data. And uh, happily the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that led to uh, uh, the Nobel Prize. And the uh, amazing thing, uh, after 40 years of a prediction that a bona fide fundamental scalar particle has actually been discovered. Now, the uh, standard model, uh, which seems to be highly verified, is regarded by theorists as an effective field theory. That is, it's a quantum field theory that is valid at energy scales below about 1 trillion electron volts. And beyond that, uh, we expect new physics to emerge. The uh, biggest problem is the Higgs mass instability problem. And uh, there's also what's called the strong CP problem in the QCD sector. Plus we necessarily have to unify with gravity and you'd like to know the origin of generations and how dark matter and dark energy emerge and how baryogenesis emerges from such a framework. 
So the first two of those problems have to do with naturalness and fine tuning. And uh, many theorists will talk about naturalness, but you may not know exactly what they mean. You hear about direct naturalness and tough technical naturalness. But I want to introduce here the uh, notion of practical naturalness. That is the way naturalness is used by working physicists in the present day. So there's no confusion. And our definition here is that an observable O is natural if all contributions to O are comparable to or less than O. You're familiar with this from perturbation theory when you do QED calculations and calculate a cross section your leading order estimate gives you roughly the right value <clears throat> and subsequent terms in the perturbation expansion are all smaller than uh, whatever observable you're calculating. If one of those contributions was far bigger, then there would have to be some other contribution which would be opposite sign uh, that would have to uh, <clears throat> be fine tuned to cancel in order to maintain O at its measured value. And um, such fine tunings are regarded as unnatural and implausible. In fact, Dirac never accepted quantum field theory because of the infinities, which seem to require fine tuning at higher orders in perturbation theory. But a pitfall occurs in this definition if uh, you have O broken apart into uh, one term B and another term minus B, whereas B goes large, i.e. the contributions are dependent. You're familiar with this in perturbation theory because you get poles, uh, divergences, uh, <clears throat> one will diverge with one sign, one with another sign. And uh, when you regularize the divergences and combine them, they cancel away. And so you have to combine dependent terms before evaluating the fine tuning of any observable, once the infinities cancel away, then uh, perturbation theory and QED was perfectly natural. Here's a, uh, in our country, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving coming up where you bake a lot of pies. And uh, an example of naturalness is if you build, build a one kilogram pie with 0.2 kilograms sugar, 0.3 kilograms flour, uh, some water and some apples and pop it in the oven and uh, bake it. So you lose about minus 0.1 kilograms of mass from evaporation. That would be a very natural apple pie. An unnatural recipe would be if you built the same pie, but added 10 tons of water to the, uh, you'd have to get a very large mixing bowl and a very large oven. And then you popped it in the oven and, uh, uh, a few hours later, took it out and uh, 10 tons exactly had uh, evaporated. Mathematically, that would be possible, but success seems highly implausible. That apple pie would be fine tuned and hence unnatural. And here, uh, unnatural really also means, uh, while it's logically possible, it's highly implausible to be the answer. How is the Higgs boson like an apple pie? Well, the biggest conundrum of the standard model is why is the Higgs mass so small? Uh, there's a lowest order mass term uh, to mh squared called two mu squared. And then when you calculate loop corrections, you find that they're quadratically divergent. Uh, here's the quadratic divergence over here where the lambda is the cutoff scale. So these divergences are actually dominated by the top quark term minus lambda t squared, they go off diverging towards negative infinity. And you have to dial two mu squared to exactly the right value to cancel off and keep the Higgs mass at 125 GeV. So to avoid the pathology of fine tuning, the standard model must be valid only out to scales of about one TeV and lambda. Uh, here's another viewpoint of the same picture. Here's the Higgs mass on the Y axis and the standard model mu parameter on the x axis. And you can see for three values of cutoff, if I cut off the theory at 10 to the three GeV, the prediction of the Higgs mass is pretty close to its actual value over most of the range of mu. And so you'd say that's natural. If the cutoff was say 10 to the 
uh, 11 uh, GeV, then uh, your natural value would be the Higgs mass would be 10 to the 10 GeV. Uh, if you want to keep it at 125, you'd have to fine tune and live on this vertical slope here. And uh, that would be uh, your Higgs mass uh, instability. So it's hardly plausible the standard model is valid much beyond the TeV scale. And that's why, of course, we go to supersymmetry. Um, supersymmetry you can regard as the square root of a trans space-time translation. And it relates bosons to fermions as uh, Biswarup and Manarajan uh, let you know in the first two talks of this series. But it's straightforward to construct supersymmetric gauge theories and in particular, you can construct a supersymmetric version of the standard model called the MSSM or minimal supersymmetric standard model. Uh, you can break the symmetry softly. And uh, once you do, uh, this solves the problem of standard model scalar fields. The quadratic divergences all cancel. Logarithmic divergences remain. And uh, then you've got a stable theory that can accommodate vastly different mass scales. For instance, the weak scale around 10 to the two GeV and the gut scale at 10 to the 16 GeV. And as a bonus, if you make this transformation uh, local so that Q, the, uh, sorry, alpha, uh, the Majorana uh, parameter depends on space time, then necessarily you have to introduce super gravity and uh, general relativity Although it's not a normalizable, it's thought to be the low energy limit of string theory compactifications. So um, I won't go over all this recipe here because it's available in this textbook by Professor Tata and I. Uh, the first part covers uh, the formalism of setting up supersymmetric Lagrangian. The second part covers a lot of popular supersymmetric models. And the third part is all devoted towards phenomenology, production and decay of superparticles, event generation and collider signatures. So the minimal supersymmetric model, as I said, is a supersymmetrized version of the standard model. So that fulfills Einstein's edict of simplicity. Uh, for each gauge boson, we have to introduce spin one half gauge genos. For each fermion, we have to introduce left and right scalars corresponding to the two helicity states. We have to introduce two Higgs doublets, HU and HD, because now the Higgses come with Higgsinos and Higgsinos are fermions. They can contribute to triangle anomalies and we have to cancel off the triangle anomalies. Uh, then we add all admissible soft Susie breaking terms and Lagrangian has 124 parameters. Uh, even more if uh, you add our parity violation or other uh, items. But the main important point is that the Lagrangian yields mass eigenstates, mixings, and Feynman rules for scattering and decay processes. And that means that the MSSM is a very predictive model. This is probably one of the big reasons it's so popular is because uh, it's extremely well-defined and predictive. So uh, we get a plethora of new physical states. Uh, spin uh, one half Majorana Gulino. Uh, we get a Charginos and Neutralinos and Sparks and Sleptons and the expanded Higgs sector. And a plethora of new states to be found at LHC and uh, possibly ILC. So um, <clears throat> you might regard this all as a figment of uh, theorists' overactive imaginations. But in fact, the MSSM is actually supported by virtual quantum effects. In the upper left of the slide, you see that if you take the measured values of the gauge couplings and evolve them under a normalization group evolution in the MSSM, that these uh, values actually unify almost exactly at a point at 10 to the 16 GeV, which we call the grand unification scale. So that's a virtual effect via the RGEs that lends uh, tremendous support to the MSSM. Uh, on the upper right slide, we have a different picture, namely one of these Higgs masses, HU, 
evolves uh, due to the large top quark Yukawa coupling under a normalization group evolution to a negative value. Normally in supergravity theories, the soft terms are all uh, positive mass squareds and electroweak symmetry won't break. But in this case, uh, it's the top quark Yukawa coupling that drives MHU squared negative. It develops a uh, Higgs potential, which breaks electroweak symmetry, but only if the top quark is 150 to 200 GeV. And of course, the top quark turned in at 173 GeV, so that worked out just right. The third thing is the Higgs mass. Uh, in supersymmetry, the Higgs mass is predicted to be uh, below the Z boson mass if you don't include radiative corrections, but if you do, its mass can range up to about 130 GeV. So this red arrow here is the data point, and the purple band is the MSSM prediction, and the blue band is the standard model prediction. So while the standard model could still be right, it's uh, amazing that the mass, Higgs mass, fell right in the range predicted by weak scale supersymmetry. And lastly, in the lower right, you see the uh, precision electroweak fits to the uh, W boson versus the top quark mass. And the green band is the prediction from the MSSM. And the red band is the standard model prediction. They overlap when you get to heavy SUSY because supersymmetry is what's called a decoupling theory. And the LEP2 and Tevatron results uh, are this uh, blue uh, band here. And you can see that it actually favors the MSSM over the standard model, but it favors the MSSM with rather heavy spectra. Now in the past, radiative corrections have proven to be a reliable guide to new physics. So this should add some encouragement towards this type of enterprise. But the question is uh, then uh, after uh, almost 10 years of running, uh, where are the super particles? So far, none are seen at the LHC, and you're familiar with these plots. The uh, left side tells us that the Galeno mass is bigger than 2.25 trillion electron volts. Uh, and the right-hand side tells us that the top squark is bigger than 1.1 trillion electron volts. So these are incredible, uh, amazing mass limits. And, um, they also appear to be in sharp conflict with uh, what's called electroweak naturalness. Back in 1987, uh, Barbieri and Judice had computed uh, bounds on superparticle masses uh, from naturalness. And in this table here, you see the Galeno should be less than 400 GeV and a Chargino should be less than 100 GeV. Barbieri and Judice were already bothered by this because LEP2 had not found charginos. And so it was already appearing that supersymmetry was unnatural. Nowadays, the LHC Galeno mass bound is five times bigger than uh, this mass limit from naturalness. And on the right hand side, you see a prediction from Cassell, Jalencia, and Graham Ross uh, of the fine tuning measure delta. If you're not fine tuned, delta should be small around. 10 to 20 to 30. And uh, you see on the uh, right side of this plot, as the Higgs mass goes up to 125 GeV, then you require delta, the fine tuning measure, to go to 1,000. And so it certainly looks like supersymmetry is highly fine tuned. So uh, that's why uh, um, the uh, lunch crowd might claim that supersymmetry seems to be. Uh, uh, excluded, and uh, it leads uh, people like Nima Arkani Hamed to uh, say, tell us that settling the ultimate fate of naturalness is perhaps the most profound theoretical question of our time. Given the magnitude of the stakes involved, it's vital to get a clear verdict on naturalness from experiment. Now, he puts the onus on the experimentalists to clear up the issue. But uh, I think uh, this should be matched by theoretical scrutiny by the theoretical community. And we have to say exactly what we mean by naturalness. And uh, we need to scrutinize those particular measures that we use that I, I said were used in the past to uh, understand naturalness.
So the question is, is there a naturalness crisis, i.e. is supersymmetry excluded? Is it now unnatural, even though it solves the big hierarchy problem? So um, <clears throat> while it does solve the big hierarchy problem, logarithmic divergences remain, but the log of a big number can be a small number. So uh, the question is, um, how do we measure naturalness? And the uh, first measure uh, people used, Ellis Enquist, Nanopoulos, Werner, and Barbieri, Judice, and later Demopoulos, Judice, applied to the z-mass. And they proposed a measure called the log derivative measure, taking d log mz squared by d log pi. That's the same as the parameter p sub i divided by mz squared times dmz squared dpi. The way you use this is you can actually expand the z-mass in terms of high scale soft terms uh, using semi-analytic solutions to the renormalization group equations. Here's an expansion for tan beta equal to 10 in terms of SUSY parameters, M1, M2, M3. These are the U1, SU2, and SU3 gay genome masses at the grand unification scale along with the mu parameter. And there's eight terms and uh, up and down big soft masses and then the squark and slepton soft terms. And this expansion uh, will tell you that uh, when you take this log derivative measure, the derivative here is just going to pick off the coefficient of any one of these terms and then multiply it by the parameter divided by mz squared. So you can see if the coefficient is large, say uh, mq3 squared, you'd pick off 0.73, multiply by mq3 squared divided by mz squared, and that would be your uh, maximal contribution. And that tells you that if mq3 squared uh, was huge compared to mz squared, then you'd be unnatural. Okay. Now, it's important when you look at this formula to notice that these coefficients come with positive and negative signs. And in particular, if you look at the second and first generation contributions, you might notice that if all these soft terms were equal, these coefficients would almost exactly cancel off. And um, also, even for the third generation, they almost exactly cancel off if you combine them with these Higgs masses. That part is known as the focus point uh, solution where large third generation squarks can be allowed even in the light of smaller electroweak naturalness. Nowadays, the biggest problem is this M3 squared. That's roughly the Galeno mass uh, at tree level. And it's got a huge coefficient, 3.84. So if we did this log derivative measure and took it with respect to M3 squared, we'd get a huge value multiplied by at least 2.25 trillion electron volts. And focus point or no focus point, we get huge fine tuning. What could be wrong? Well, um, these parameters P sub I are introduced by humans to parameterize our ignorance of correlations in the soft terms that occur in more fundamental theory. So um, what uh, Barbieri Judice does is it measures fine tuning in our computer codes, but it doesn't measure the fine tuning uh, in nature. For an example, uh, in the uh, Poloni model of supersymmetry breaking, all these soft terms are calculable in terms of a single fundamental parameter, the gravitino mass. And so uh, all the scalar masses are equal to m gravitino squared. The a, b, and uh, gay genome mass, big M, are also calculable in terms of the gravitino mass. And uh, if you plug in all these values into the previous expression, then major cancellations occur in the mz squared expansion. And what looked like it was fine-tuned may in fact be natural because the soft terms are all correlated. And in any fundamental theory, you expect to be able to cancel uh, not only the Poloni model, but all models you expect uh, in gravity mediation to be able to calculate the soft terms in terms of the gravitino mass. So there's only really one parameter and not 
uh, numerous soft parameters. There's only soft parameters because we don't know the right model of SUSY breaking. But once we did know that, then uh, we could uh, collapse that expansion. And that expansion, notice mu is not a supersymmetry breaking term. All the rest of these are SUSY breaking. So mu would have to uh, cancel against what all this stuff would collapse into. And uh, what this collapses into is MHU squared at the weak scale. So um, that's the uh, flaw in Barbieri and Judice, uh, and it can right easily be fixed by introducing only one soft term, namely the gravitino mass. There's a different me measure that you might see in the literature, uh, which is called high scale or stop mass uh, fine tuning measure. And that's to break the Higgs mass into mu term plus MHU squared at the weak scale. And then to break MHU squared into MHU squared at the high scale plus delta MHU squared. And then you calculate this delta and look at its value over the, uh, compared to the Higgs mass itself. Now what people do in order to calculate delta MHU squared is you have to integrate the renormalization group equation, which contains the log divergences. And uh, what people do is they set this first term equal to zero and the second term equal to zero and the third term equal to zero. And in the fourth term, it's got a top Yukawa coupling squared times XT. And in XT, you also set MHU squared equal to zero. And once you do all that, then you can integrate this in a single step from the weak scale to the gut scale and you get this expression with the large log in it. Um, the lar log of m gut squared over m weak squared is roughly a factor of 30. And so if you've got large third generation contributions here, this tends to tell you that the top sparks there should be three third generation sparks with mass less than 500 GeV. Now the problem here is that uh, this delta MHU squared is not independent of MHU squared as we saw in our definition of fine tuning. It depends on MHU squared right down here. And in fact, the bigger you make the gut scale contribution, the uh, bigger is the uh, delta MHU squared but of negative sign and when they combine as we're supposed to do in practical naturalness, you see the combined term can actually get small at uh, large enough values of MHU squared at the gut scale. This can be denoted pictorially by uh, the running of MHU squared. The blue curve over here on the left uh, has got a small MHU squared at the gut scale. It runs negative but large and that's going to require high fine tuning to get a Z mass of 100 GeV. But if you make it bigger enough, then it barely runs negative and this green curve would be natural. If you make it bigger yet, the red curve doesn't run negative and you get no electroweak symmetry breaking. So in this, for this measure to be valid, you really need to combine these latter two terms here and that gives you MHU squared at the weak scale as the proper thing to be used in Higgs mass fine tuning. So this uh, horse should be put out to pasture. Uh, sub TEV third generation sparks are not required for naturalness. Um, and one has to take better care of one's measures of naturalness. Um, <clears throat> now what really happens when you run computer codes that calculate the super particle spectrum is that uh, at some point they have to minimize the Higgs potential and make sure electroweak symmetry is really broken. And normally you input a bunch of soft terms at the gut scale and it calculates those soft terms at the weak scale. And when you minimize the potential, it relates the Z mass to the weak scale, supersymmetry Lagrangian terms, MHD squared, MHU squared and mu squared. This is roughly minus MHU squared, which is a positive term because remember MHU squared runs to negative values at the weak scale. This sigma UU contains over 40 loop corrections. And then mu squared is a supersymmetry preserving term called the mu parameter. It comes from different physics, whatever determines the mu parameter. 
So if MHU squared runs deep negative, then this thing, which comes from completely different physics, or this guy, which comes from loop corrections, would have to be magically fine-tuned to cancel this to keep MZ at its measured value. <clears throat> so uh, a normal term from uh, the CMSSM or MSUGRA model, if you graph this formula, it would give you a Z mass uh, that might naturally be around 10 to the, well, this is about five times 10 to the three GeV, 5,000 GeV, but you would have to convince yourself that the mu parameter had exactly the right value to live on this steep slope to give you MZ uh, uh, right down here at 91.2 GeV. And that seems highly implausible. If you're natural, then the Z mass comes in close to its measured value. And uh, um, then you're uh, better off. So nobody sees this because it's hidden inside the computer codes and uh, you don't realize that uh, whatever you've generated actually has some high fine tuning involved in it. So we introduced a uh, simplest SUSY measure called delta electroweak and that basically uses the electroweak minimization condition and tells you that the biggest term on the right-hand side of this expression compared to mz squared over two is the proper measure of fine tuning. <clears throat> and uh, then you can easily uh, see what the implications are of fine tuning. This mu term is SUSY conserving, as I said, it feeds mass to the WZ and Higgs, which are all around 100 GeV, but it also feeds mass to Higgsinos uh, since it's SUSY conserving. And so the First implication is that Higgsinos have to be light around 100 to 200 to 300 GeV because these terms should be comparable to or less than mz squared over two. Comparable means within a factor of a few, three or four. Also MHU squared should be driven to small negative values such that it's in the vicinity of 100 to 200 or 300 GeV. And the remaining super particles are all suppressed by loop factors. And so they can be large and live in the TEV regime. So uh, this gives a more model independent and uh, robust uh, rendition of naturalness in supersymmetric theories. Um, as I say, this green curve is the one that's natural, black is unnatural, and red doesn't lead to electroweak symmetry breaking in the evolution of the up Higgs mass squared. Uh, then the next question is how much is too much fine tuning, i.e. how big can delta get? And here I list uh, the top 10 contributions to the electroweak fine tuning parameter delta uh, for different values of mu for a particular uh, SUSY model. And you can see if the mu parameter is down around 100 GeV, all these contributions, top 10 contributions, some are positive and some are negative, but they're all comparable to mz squared. And so this is quite natural. As you go to 200 GeV, you're still in that situation, but as mu gets bigger, ultimately, um, the fine tuning turns on visually and you can see that you're having to unnaturally make one of these terms large opposite sign in order to accommodate the other one blowing up. And the fine tuning becomes uh, uh, very great already for mu bigger than uh, four or five, 600 GeV. So uh, we would uh, say to be conservative, Delta should be less than 30, which uh, corresponds to the in between case of these two pieces here, uh, where the fine tuning is clearly turned on. So uh, that's uh, a uh, particular, you could take 20 or 40, um, but uh, 30 seems like a conservative value. If we go ahead and use this new measure to calculate upper bounds on super particle masses, we get the same value uh, upper bound for the mu parameter, which was 350 GeV from Barbieri Judice. So the Higgsinos still have to be light. 
Uh, but now the galeno mass, which only enters the weak scale at two loops, can range up to six TeV. And remember, the LHC bound is 2.2 TeV. The top spark can range up to three TeV. And remember, the bound is 1.1 TeV. And the first and second generation sparks and sleptons can range up to 10 to 30 TeV because they give tiny contributions to the weak scale that are suppressed by their Yukawa couplings and electroweak D terms, which uh, largely cancel. <clears throat> so in this case, a 125 GV Higgs mass and LHC mass limits are perfectly compatible with three to 10% naturalness, and there really is no crisis. It's just a uh, crisis in using older, naive, oversimplified measures of fine tuning to evaluate your naturalness. Uh, so uh, reading off from low delta electro weak, this is what the typical spectrum should look like for natural SUSY models. The gauge bosons, Higgs bosons, and Higgsinos should all be clustered down around the one to two or 300 GeV range. Phenos and Winos can be uh, heavier and range up to uh, TeV. And these uh, first and second generation matter scalars can range up into the tens of TeV value, maybe even 40 TeV <clears throat> with top sparks ranging up to uh, two to three TeV <clears throat> for the lightest one. So there is a little hierarchy here. Uh, namely, you get a hierarchy between the weak scale and some of these particles. Uh, it's basically that the mu parameter should be uh, much less than the gravitino mass, which in gravity mediation sets the scale for the soft terms. Uh, but it's no problem, and Higgsinos are the likely lightest superparticles. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now that naturalness is cleared up, we can see what its impact is on supersymmetric models, which is what I was supposed to talk about anyway. And the first one is the case of gravity mediation in uh, supersymmetry breaking uh, how models. You, uh, yeah. How was it? Yeah, so sorry to interrupt you. There is a question in the chat box. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the question is, uh, why are we looking for three to 10% naturalness? Oh, uh, three to 10% corresponds to, 3% uh, <clears throat> corresponds to delta electro weak less than 30. So on a previous slide, I'd showed where the naturalness turns on. Um, so 3% corresponds to uh, this case right in here where you see that the fine tuning is turned on. 10% uh, would be a little bit lower. And so uh, that's why we look for three to 10%. Uh, here we're looking for supersymmetry to be completely natural and not um, allowing any fine tuning really at all. Oh, so there's a second okay. question there. No, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, let's start with gravity mediation. In these models, we start with the non-renormalizable N equal one four-dimensional supergravity Lagrangian. You can find it in uh, our weak scale SUSY book. You can also find it in Peter Nillis's old review article, but there's two typos in his Lagrangian. And uh, in that Lagrangian, you can arrange for what's called a hidden sector, uh, super potential, and uh, put one in that breaks super gravity. So that's called the super Higgs mechanism. It develops what's called a F or D breaking uh, term, which causes super gravity to break. And the textbook example is the Poloni superpotential is a source of spontaneous supergravity breaking. The F term of that hidden sector field gains a non-zero vacuum expectation value, um, which we call M hidden squared because F is a mass squared parameter. And that value, if it's around 10 to the 11 GeV, then it gives you a gravitino mass of 10 to the 11 squared over M Planck and uh, you get a TeV scale value of the gravitino mass. The non-renormalizable terms in the supergravity Lagrangian 
turn into what are called soft supersymmetry breaking terms when they have values of order M3 halves around one TV. And so what people do is they take the limit as M Planck goes to infinity while keeping the gravitational mass M3 has fixed. In that particular limit, then the local supergravity model comes in the low energy limit, a global SUSY model plus soft supersymmetry breaking terms, i.e. in that limit, you get back the MSSM if you put in the standard model gauge symmetry and matter multiplets. So the soft SUSY breaking terms consist of just these four terms, the scalar masses, there's trilinear or eight terms, there's a B term, which you usually don't see because it gets traded for tan beta, and then there's gauge masses uh, for the uh, Bino, Wino, and Gulino. Um, now, uh, model number one is a popular model called the CMSSM or minimal supergravity model. There we posit the standard model gauge symmetry and three generations of matter superfields and use two Higgs doublets and or a normalizable gauge invariant superpotential, which consists of the new term, plus these three Yukawa coupling terms here. And then we add all allowed soft SUSY breaking terms at the gut scale. And for simplicity, one assumes that all the soft terms unify at the gut scale. Uh, so you get parameters M0, A0, M1 half, and B. And uh, I've got a footnote here that uh, simplicity uh, is a bad assumption here. So um, I'll address that in a few minutes. But uh, once you've done all, all that, then the, uh, you minimize the Higgs potential and trade the B soft breaking term for tan beta via this top relationship here. And you can tune the mu parameter such as to make the Z mass equal to 91.2. This is the hidden fine tuning that I mentioned. And um, notice here that, that since the mu term is from the super potential and it's not SUSY breaking, it's SUSY conserving, you'd expect it naturally to be up the Planck scale because the Planck scale is the only scale in the supergravity model until you introduce scales by hand in the SUSY breaking sector. So this begets what's called the SUSY mu problem. Where does that mu parameter come from? Anyways, once you've done all this, then you can run all couplings and soft SUSY breaking terms from the gut scale to the weak scale, compute the mass eigenstates and mixings. That gives you the Feynman rules in order to calculate cross sections and decay rates and make predictions. So uh, an example here is, uh, here's the unified scalar masses uh, that are running to their various terms. The uh, squarks run to high values and uh, MHU squared runs negative and causes electroweak symmetry to break. Um, now in days past, people would frequently plot this out in the M0 versus M1 half plane the red regions are excluded because you don't get electroweak symmetry breaking or you get a stow as the light of SUSY particle. And all this white region is allowed. If you calculate the relic density of neutralinos, then uh, you actually have to live on the boundary of the green and yellow. So you'd have to live over here in the small mu region, sometimes called focus point region, or you have to live in the stow co-annihilation region unless you go to large tan beta and then you can live in the A funnel region where you can get resonant neutralino annihilation in the early universe through the A Higgs boson. Um, now there's problems with this model, um, namely in supergravity, the scalar masses should not be universal. This is known since 1984 by Sony and Weldon and it gives rise to what's called the SUSY flavor and CP problem, namely if the scalar masses are non-universal, then you get potentially large uh, contributions to flavor violating and CP violating processes. There's a second problem in the QCD sector that uh, I mentioned earlier, the strong CP problem, 
And you probably need the presence of an axion in order to solve this problem. A third problem is that uh, the relic abundance, uh, if you did include an axion, then you need to put the axion into a super multiplet. And uh, there may be additional sources like saxions and axinos to the relic density. And there also should be what are called string moduli fields. And these also affect the relic density. So this simple thermal relic picture is probably not right in the larger context of string theory. Uh, fourthly, uh, you should augment with the source of the mu term. Now, usually it's a, people say something called Judice Maciero, uh, which um, could be a source of the mu parameter, but there's very many other possibilities, some perhaps better motivated. Uh, there's the NMSSM that Rohini uh, is a champion of, and then there's other solutions as well. So I'll address those later on. And lastly, the remaining parameter space of this model, if you require the Higgs mass to be 125 GV and LHC particle mass bounds to be fulfilled is highly unnatural. And so a picture of this is uh, up here in the upper left. We can see these nat three naturalness uh, limits, delta BG, delta high scale, and delta electroweak by these uh, red, green, and orange curves. And that all tells you that supersymmetry should live in the lower uh, left corner. And the Guino mass limit is up here at 2.2 TeV, which says you got to live way up here. And it looks like supersymmetry is unnatural. If you scan over the full parameter space with three LHC limits, delta electro weak is always bigger than 80. And so this, this is why we would claim the CMSSM is likely excluded. It doesn't, uh, what remains of the parameter space is highly unnatural. So if you're fine living with unnatural models, then you can have this, but uh, it may well be excluded. So let me make a few comments on soft term universality, because this is a big issue, especially with models like the CMSSM. In the CMSSM, the gauge masses are unified to M1 half. This assumption is pretty well motivated by simple structure of the gate, what's called the gauge kinetic function. This is a, a function which gives rise to gauge masses in supergravity models. And it's in many string models, it's just a uh, factor K times the dilaton field, which gives rise to gauge couplings. And uh, this type of a term of the gauge kinetic function naturally leads to unified gauge masses. So that's a good assumption. For scalar masses, you actually expect non-universality, especially in the Higgs multiplets versus the matter multiplets. For the matter multiplets, uh, it's more, more plausible that they unify to a value M0, but the Higgs multiplets live in different gut representations and there's really no reason at all for them to be unified with uh, the matter scalar masses. Now, there should be intragenerational scalar mass universality. That is, all the scalars within a generation are well motivated to be universal since those matter fields fill out a complete 16 dimensional spinner of SO10. That's one of the amazing features of uh, SO10 is that you get not only unification of gauge couplings, but you get unification of matter into a single spinner. However, the different generation universality is not well motivated. Thus, you should have a different M0 for the first generation and a different one for the second and a different one for the third. Although this does beget the SUSE flavor and CP problems. And finally, a term universality. Um, this is usually not important as only the third generation uh, a term a sub t gives large stop mixing and Higgs mass contributions. And the other ones are uh, suppressed by uh, Yukawa coupling uh, multipliers. So um, at this point, I also want to 
since I brought up the issue of uh, guts, I want to make a few comments on supersymmetric grand unified theories. Um, some aspects of SU5 and SO10 gut models are highly motivated. For instance, gauge coupling unification uh, is highly motivated and matter unification in the 16 dimensional spinner of SO10 is highly motivated. However, conventional four dimensional SUSY gut theories seem in the theoretical community to be increasingly unlikely they're difficult to embed properly in string theory, which uh, is our only choice for unifying gravity with uh, uh, particle physics. In the heterotic string models, you get an E8 cross E8 symmetry, which uh, one of the E8s breaks down to E6, and you get a whole host of unwanted matter states along with extra Higgs particles that you don't want, the so-called Double triplet splitting problem. And so that seems uh, rather uh, unlikely. Uh, in the uh, 21st century, there's also brain world models where you get uh, brains in the compactified uh, extra dimensions of string theory. These allow only small, simple groups and uh, not grand unified groups. And in addition, there's no large matter or Higgs representations present that you usually need to break the gut symmetry in the SU5 or SO10 SUSY gut models. Uh, these gut groups may come from what are called F-theory string models, but these are not uh, that well understood. What seems increasingly well motivated are what are called local gut models uh, by, uh, that are exposed in this paper by Buchmiller et al where different gut groups occur at different locations on the 6D compactified space uh, of uh, string theory. Uh, in these types of spaces, for instance, you can get matter living in the 16 of SO10 at certain locales, but the Higgses and the gauge superfields end up living in split multiplets in the bulk of the parameter space. So the different representations depend on where different fields live in the compactified dimensions. This is also exposed by a nice uh, review article by Nillis and Vodravange uh, that I list here. And I urge people to take a look at those papers to get improved uh, modern perspective on uh, grand unified theories in string theory and uh, particle physics. Now, um, <clears throat> since uh, I mentioned uh, non-universality seems to be the rule rather than the, the exception. We can go to the next simplest thing, which is uh, breaking apart the Higgs soft masses at the gut scale. And then we get a new parameter space. It's bigger than CMSSM. It's called the non-universal Higgs mass two extra parameter model. And so we have to add MHU and MHD to the case. Um, and remember the advantage of this for naturalness is if MHU is a free parameter, we can pull its mass up until its evolution barely breaks electroweak symmetry and then we get a natural model. This can also be seen because we can trade MHU and MHD via the electroweak minimization conditions. For the uh, mu parameter and MA, the mass of the uh, pseudoscalar Higgs boson and use these weak scale inputs instead of these gut scale inputs, then we can always have small mu and this model does allow naturalness. So uh, this is a good candidate for a natural supersymmetry model. And in fact, if you scan over this parameter space, um, you can find delta values as low as uh, 10 or in some cases even lower. So uh, what naturalness seems to tell us is that uh, you should have split Higgs multiplets, which we already know based on the fact that the Higgses live in different gut multiplets than the uh, matter scalars. Uh-oh, my uh, <clears throat> screen stopped advancing. Oh, there it goes. I pushed a different button and it advanced. So here is the uh, NUHM2 model in M0 versus M1 half parameter space. 
Remember the CMSSM to be natural had to live in the lower left. And in fact, Barbieri Judice says you should live below the orange curve. But now the delta lector weak less than 30 has a green curve up here. And the Higgs mass being 125 GV can live anywhere in this big broad space here. Here's the LHC Galeno mass bound. And you see a big chunk of parameter space lies beyond the LHC mass bound. So there's plenty of natural parameter space with a Higgs mass of 125 and a Galeno bigger than 2.25 TeV in this model. Uh, now you could also go with additional generational non-universality as well. And then you get NUHM3 and NUHM4. If you set these first and second generation matter scalars equal to each other, but not equal to M03, then you get the three parameter NUHM2 model. And if you have separate uh, generations for all these, then you get NUHM4. Um, these models allow for a decoupling solution to the SUSY flavor and CP problem, mainly that M01 and M02 of the first two generations can be pulled up into the 30, 40 TeV range while maintaining naturalness. And those huge first and second generation masses naturally suppress any flavor violating or CP violating processes since they hardly contribute at all to the weak scale. So uh, we'll see that there's actually a mechanism from the spring landscape that pulls us into that area. Um, and since I'm talking about non-universality, let me make a few comments on the PMSSM uh, 19 parameter. This is a popular model um, that uh, many people use uh, in the at least, especially in the experimental community. Um, and uh, it proposes to just use the soft terms of the MSSM at the weak scale, basically throw out the renormalization group running and choose 19 free parameters. And uh, this is touted as being a rather general model, but uh, the problem is it discards several major success stories of supersymmetry namely the gauge coupling unification, uh, the radiative electroweak symmetry breaking via the large top quark mass, and uh, the general the normalization group correlations amongst the parameters. Now, even if you do use this model, delta electroweak is a model independent measure. It doesn't care if your spectra is generated from the PMSSM or some high scale model you get exactly the same delta electro weak value. So at least from a given spectra, uh, you'll get the same fine tuning. But the correlations amongst the soft terms, such as a large M Galeno, if you have a huge Galeno mass that actually pulls up the squark masses. And um, <clears throat> we'll see later on that there's a landscape pull of different generations to high values. Uh, and these upper bounds that come from combining delta electro weak with the renormalization group evolution get ignored. Thus, I'm not particularly a fan of PMSSM analysis. If you want 19 free parameters, you can still have 19 free parameters, but include the renormalization group running. Then you get what's called the 19 parameter SUGRA model. And I would probably urge instead that the people use this model instead of PMSSM and don't throw away the successes of the normalization group running. Um, <clears throat> let's see, how am I doing on time? I think I'm uh, at the one hour mark, am I not? Uh, does anybody need a, Short break. So, yeah, so if you want, you can take a short break. I mean, well, I'm good to go, but uh, maybe it will be a good idea for the students also to take a five minutes break and then you can resume to yeah, digest, to digest to whatever take, you have said. Take a short break and then we'll address B yeah. minus two. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Thank you.
Uh, professor, may I just one query? I mean, uh, will you may, may discuss like and uh, this non-universal gauge no masses in, bit, in slightly more detail or in like depending on different kind of you know breaking patterns of SO10, uh, uh, you get different kind of gauge no masses and all those things. Students, if you have any question, uh, so far you can drop in the chat box, such that one, one, once we resume the second part, okay, we can uh, convey those questions to Professor Bear. Yeah, Professor Bear, when you are ready, please let oh, okay. us know. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> well, now that we're on the topic of non-universality, we can apply this to the uh, recent uh, G minus two of the muon discrepancy. Yeah. Uh, there was a Brookhaven discrepancy from around uh, the year 2000, and this has been confirmed by recent Fermilab uh, uh, results. And if you use the dispersive hadronic vacuum polarization uh, evaluation, uh, then you find that you do get a discrepancy between theory and experiment on G minus two. If you use certain lattice results, the discrepancy disappears. But if the discrepancy is real, then uh, we've known for a long time that you need light smuons and muon neutrinos in order to explain it. Basically the smuons need to be less than about 700 GeV to explain this sort of discrepancy. But uh, you have to be aware of recent LHC constraints that uh, in simplified models that M-slepton should be bigger than 700 GeV. 
from both Atlas and CMS. So there seems to be a boondoggle here between theory and experiment as far as trying to explain G minus two. But remember, we can now uh, do not expect generational uh, universality. And there is one case called a normal scalar mass hierarchy where the first two generation soft masses are much lighter than the third generation. So in this case, the scalar masses uh, are arranged similar to the fermion masses of the standard model. And in this case, uh, this was proposed in 2004 to reconcile B to S gamma, which requires heavy top quarks with a G minus two deviation. And now it can also be used to boost the Higgs mass up to 125 GeV if the third generation is rather heavy. So if we go to the NUHM3 model, this allows for naturalness and a small mu value, but could also potentially explain G minus two. So if you scan over all these parameters and require proper electroweak breaking and naturalness and a Higgs mass and LHC limits, you can actually, there is a small segment of parameter space that you can explain G minus two with. And that is here's uh, Delta A mu, the G minus two discrepancy. You wanna live between these dashed lines here to explain the discrepancy. And the orange points come from the NUHM2 model with generational universality. All the orange points are below this region. And so you can't fulfill G minus two. Um, the gray points come from NUHM2 and three, but are below LHC limits. Uh, the blue points match LHC limits. And then the green points come from the three extra parameter they obey LHC limits and match G minus two of the muons so they can actually live in this region here. For these models, uh, you expect the first and second generation to be quite light at the gut scale. And then it drives the left muon masses to low enough values that uh, you can explain the G minus two discrepancy. So um, here's a possible benchmark point that does the job, you see that M01 and 2 are 368 GeV at the gut scale. They evolve to big values that just barely obey LHC constraints at the weak scale, but you get these uh, left muons and unus neutrinos around the 300 GeV range. And the right so, uh, smuons get driven to much bigger masses about over one TeV. That's because this S term in the RGEs uh, <clears throat> actually gets split and it makes a big contribution to the RGE running, which drives the left sleptons down and the right sleptons uh, get heavier. So uh, this sort of thing uh, would be needed in order to explain the G minus two anomaly via non-unified uh, matter generations. These green points evade the LHC slepton bounds because the muon branching fractions are very different than in the simplified model. For instance, the mu neutrinos mainly decay invisibly or into a muon plus a uh, hexeno like neutralino. The hexeno like neutralino is quasi visible. And so these uh, branching fractions are much smaller than uh, in the simplified model, where you assume 100% branching into these modes. And uh, likewise for the left muons. So uh, this can evade LHC slepton bounds for the moment, but uh, new analysis would probably be required to see if this is allowed. Uh, now let me come to a different old favorite. Uh, this is called gauge mediated SUSY breaking or GMSB. In this type of model, it's not gravity mediated. Uh, so you arrange for a low scale supergravity breaking, i.e. a light gravitino. But the main soft term contribution comes from a hidden sector that's coupled to the visible sector via gauge interactions. And that's why it's called gauge mediation. The beauty of this approach is that you get automatic what's called matter scalar universality. 
since the gauge quantum numbers are the same for each generation, this solves the Susie flavor problem that comes from non-degenerate generations. Now in this approach, the trilinear soft term A is tiny, it's basically zero. And that's a problem because uh, a large A term gives you large top squirt mixing and uh, that feeds into the Higgs mass and boosts it up to the 125 GeV range. So this uh, model, if you want a Higgs mass of 125 GeV, you can't do it via stop mixing. Instead, you need huge stop soft terms to jack up the Higgs mass. That means the huge top squirt uh, soft terms make those sigma contributions to naturalness huge and make the model highly unnatural and it's likely excluded from naturalness and the Higgs mass. Here's a picture of what's happening. This lambda is the uh, messenger scale. The bigger it gets, the bigger the super particle masses get. And um, if you're a tiny lambda, you get tiny Higgs masses. Only to get to 125, you need huge lambda. And that jacks the uh, top squirt soft terms up into the uh, tens of TeV range and delta electroweak is always bigger than a thousand. So one thing LHC seems to be doing is excluding uh, gauge mediated SUSY breaking models. Uh, there's another old favorite called anomaly mediated SUSY breaking models. In this type of model, uh, <clears throat> one includes loop corrections to the uh, soft terms. And so you can see these, uh, all the soft terms have a G squared over 16 pi squared factor, which shows their loop suppressed contribution. And then if you arrange for the normal Sugar contributions to be small by building what's called a sequestered sector in extra dimensions of string compactification, then you can get these loop terms being the dominant contribution. Now the usual lore is then that you get a Wino as the light of Suzy particle because this M2 here has a smaller coefficient than M1 or M3. And so you get the uh, Wino LSP, which gives you a different type of phenomenology. So uh, for these models, actually that A term, uh, I don't list the A term here, but the A term is rather small and also doesn't help jack up the Higgs mass. And so again, you have to go to huge M3 halves values. Here you can see 400, 500, 600 TeV in order to jack the Higgs mass up to 125 GeV. So again, these models, uh, in order to get a Higgs mass of 125, require huge delta values bigger than 100. And so they likely, likely look excluded as well. Furthermore, uh, in this case, you get Wino dark matter and Wino's annihilate strongly. Even if they made up the dark matter, uh, they would be living in dwarf spheroidal galaxies and would give huge contributions to antimatter and gamma rays. And they seem excluded from indirect detection of dark matter. Um, but the minimal model uh, that people use is artificial. It could be uh, that uh, in addition to adding bulk contributions to the scalar masses, uh, there could be a large bulk contribution to A0. This is even mentioned by Randall and Sundram in their original paper, but people just discarded it for no good reason. And there should be different bulk contributions to the up and down Higgs masses. So uh, if one adds in these extra contributions, you get what's called the natural AMSB model with extra parameters, different bulk contributions to the generations and the A parameter bulk term as well. And in that case, you can jack up the Higgs mass to 125 GeV and be natural with a small mu term. In this case, you get uh, still the Wino is the lightest of the gay genos. However, it's not the lightest of the electroweak enos. The electroweak, lightest electroweak eno can be hexeno like and uh, you get a natural model of anomaly mediation. So this one has not been explored much in the literature, uh, but reconciles naturalness with anomaly mediation and the uh, 125 GV Higgs mass. 
and a uh, further candidate uh, for supersymmetry breaking is what's called mirage mediation. This class of models receives comparable soft term contributions from gravity mediation and anomaly mediation. Um, and since the anomaly mediation contribution to gay genome masses is proportional to the beta functions, this model will offset the gay genome mass universality by the beta functions. And then the RGE running compensates for the beta function offset to cause the gay genome masses to unify at an intermediate scale while the gauge couplings unify at the gut scale. That's why it's called mirage mediation because there's a false unification of the gay genome masses at some intermediate scale. So uh, this is uh, probably the right way to implement the anomaly mediation, but the simplest models which are based on the KKLT scenario of uh, moduli stabilization with a single Kähler modulus, uh, all seem excluded by the Higgs mass of 125 at GED and naturalness. However, um, the KKLT model with a single Kähler modulus is not right. The Kähler moduli should number in the hundreds in realistic string compactifications. And that allows you to move to a natural generalized mirage mediation or NGMM. This has the same mirage mediation parameters of gravitino mass and alpha, which gives you the relative uh, anomaly and gravity mediation. But then you get some extra contributions to the A parameter and the different generations that allow you to uh, implement mu and MA at the weak scale and then you get small mu solutions. So in these models, you still get the compressed gay genos, but you can allow for a Higgs mass of 125 GeV with a small mu parameter and natural spectra. And uh, you get uh, extra contributions to the soft terms that allow you to have the split Higgs multiplets that uh, can run to natural values at the weak scale. So that can be fixed up uh, as well. Now I want to come to a uh, different issue. You can see the centrality that mu parameter plays in SUSY models. And uh, before I'd mentioned uh, the SUSY mu problem, that mu term is from the superpotential, which means it's SUSY conserving and not SUSY breaking. And uh, for a SUSY conserving parameter, we expect it to be of order of the Planck scale while phenomenology requires mu to be of order the weak scale. Um, there's a variety of ways to solve this problem. Uh, one is in the NMSSM where you introduce an additional uh, gauge singlet and uh, couple HU and HD to S. Uh, there's tricky problems with that. Uh, Bagger and Poppets showed that uh, if you add additional singlets to the MSSM, then you may reintroduce the gauge hierarchy problem. So, uh, and you also have to wonder how that extra singlet fits into gut representations, which all other fields, chiral fields seem to live in. There's Judice Massiero, which says mu is forbidden by some arbitrary symmetry that is not specified, but then is generated by Higgs coupling to hidden sector fields. Then you get mu term behaving like a soft term. And the third popular one is Kim Millis. This invokes a supersymmetrized version of an axion model called DFSC, which necessarily requires two Higgs doublets to solve the strong CP problem. In Kim Millis, uh, you get, uh, you invoke a Peche Quinn symmetry, which gives rise to the axion, but it also forbids the mu term from existing in the first place. And that's why it's not of order of the Planck scale. But then when you break peche quinn symmetry, the mu term gets generated, but it's generated at a Yukawa coupling lambda mu times PQ scale FA squared over M Planck. And this is compared to the soft term breaking scale M3 halves, which is M hidden squared over M Planck. So you can see 
that mu can be much less than m soft if the peche quin symmetry breaking scale is somewhat less than the hidden sector SUSY breaking scale. And furthermore, uh, since the mu parameter by naturalness should be around 100 GeV, and you know M Planck, if you knew lambda mu, that would tell you what the peche quin scale is, and that would tell you where to look for the axion. So in these types of models, the axion is intricately linked with the mu parameter and with supersymmetry, which is a rather beautiful picture, I think. Uh, here's a uh, reference to a recent review paper that actually covers 20 solutions to the SUSY mu problem. Hopefully you can see your favorite solution here, or if you didn't have one, now you know that there's a whole literature of solutions to the mu problem. Uh, <clears throat> Judice Massiero, uh, uh, Casas, Munoz, etc. It goes down the line here. And the latest one is what's called the hybrid CCK uh, model, which is a Kim Nillis type solution, which actually gives you amazing extra features that you may not have realized that you needed. Um, <clears throat> because as I mentioned, in the QCD sector of the standard model, there's this extra fine tuning problem called the strong CP problem, namely, this term is completely allowed in QCD that couples the gluon field strength to its dual times a theta bar parameter, which receives contributions from QCD and from the quark mass matrix. And this theta bar term is less than 10 to the negative 10, whereas these two terms should be of order one. So the question is, why is that so teensy? And the only plausible solution after 35 years is that there's a global U1 PQ symmetry with a concomitant axion. That also gives a contribution to this term. And uh, the axion field can let this term relax to zero and solve the strong CP problem. But there's a problem with a global U1 uh, symmetry that you have to introduce, namely global U1s are not consistent with gravity completion or string theory. And uh, furthermore, you'd expect in string theory, the axion scale to be of order in guck to and Planck, but cosmology favors it to be around 10 to the 11 GeV. Happily, if you supersymmetrize the axion sector, SUSY can help solve both these problems. In SUSY, the axion superfield also contains a spin one half axion on a spin zero saxion. And uh, in the SUSY DFSC axion model, you get a solution to the SUSY mu problem via this Kim Millis operator, where M, H, U, and H, D are coupled to S squared uh, times lambda over M Planck. So this is a Planck suppressed term. But if SUSY breaking occurs, then this S term develops a VEV of order FA, and then you get a mu term that can be of order the weak scale. Now, uh, the beautiful thing uh, <clears throat> occurs in that um, instead of positing a uh, gravity unsafe uh, U1PQ symmetry, you can posit a, what's called a discrete R symmetry. These are expected to arise from compactification of extra dimensions in string theory. Uh, they actually, the superspace coordinates carry an R charge of plus one, so the super potential carries an R charge of plus two. Here's the uh, discrete R symmetry values that go around the complex plane. And if you, uh, these authors here, uh, Lee et al, categorized all the discrete R symmetries that are consistent with grand unification and are anomaly free. Uh, Z4R up to Z24R. And uh, the generic super potential should contain a mu term uh, and other terms, but it can also contain R parity violating terms and dangerous dimension five proton decay operators, which are Planck suppressed. Uh, so these R symmetries forbid the mu term in the first place. They forbid the R parity violating operators. They forbid the dimension five proton decay operators, but they allow the usual Yukawa couplings 
and they allow the seesaw term, seesaw neutrino term. So the uh, Z24R symmetry is strong enough that it actually fulfills a condition laid out by Tammy and Kowski and March Russell years ago for what a gravity safe axion model should be. Namely that uh, any terms to the scalar potential of the axion have to be suppressed by eight powers of Planck at least to ensure that theta bar is less than 10 to the 10. Um, and so almost all these uh, PQ SUSY DFAC models are not gravity safe because they give you operators suppressed by a fewer powers than in Planck to the eighth. But the Z24 model uh, actually introduces two extra fields, X and Y, to the MSSM fields, and then couples them to the uh, HU and HD. Here it is, X squared HUHD over M Planck. And uh, when you break supersymmetry, the U1 PQ and R parity both emerge as accidental approximate symmetries from the more fundamental Z24 R symmetry. So this gives you a mode to generate a sharp PQ symmetry that is gravity safe, solves the SUSY mu problem, solves the uh, strong CP problem, and gives rise to R parity conservation as well. And uh, allows mu to be far less than the soft term scale. So that's a awesome uh, thing, I think. And this gives you the parameter space of this model showing part of it's not allowed, but uh, plenty of it for different Peche Quinn scales in the cosmologically favored region uh, gives you a small mu parameter. Um, now, I've been talking so far about a lot of supersymmetric models and naturalness. However, some people will uh, tell you that um, naturalness is no longer required because of the string theory landscape. And uh, the idea here is that uh, in string theory over the past 20 years, people have realized that there are a tremendous number of different vacuum solutions to string theory each different vacuum solution gives rise to different uh, four-dimensional laws of physics. And all these different vacua can be uh, connected with one another in a uh, multiverse instead of a universe, which is the natural extension of combining general relativity and quantum mechanics. Basically, you get what's called the chaotic inflation model or eternal inflation. And that gives you the initial conditions for our universe to arise as a particular inflating pocket universe. Now you might say this is all uh, way too far beyond our imaginations, but not for Steve Weinberg. Uh, he actually was able to use this sort of scenario uh, even before the spring landscape emerged to explain the smallness of the cosmological constant. Namely, the cosmological constant is, seems to be tuned by over 120 orders of magnitude. But Weinberg noticed that if the cosmological constant was distributed over those uh, 120 more orders of magnitude, uh, all its values that were too big would lead to uh, a runaway universe with no galaxy condensation. And from that point of view, it's no surprise we live in a universe with a small cosmological constant <clears throat> because if the cosmological constant was much bigger, we wouldn't be around to uh, exist. So that's called an environmental or anthropic explanation for the tininess of the cosmological constant. And uh, that was put in a string theory context by Brousseau and Polchinski. And there was a recent review on this by Mike Douglas uh, in 2018 Universe uh, Journal. So uh, the question is, if that works for the cosmological constant, then maybe it works also for the weak scale. Maybe uh, the weak scale should be tiny as well, just due to anthropic grounds. And then we don't need supersymmetry at all. Um, however, uh, Mike Douglas made a statistical analysis of the SUSY breaking scale in type 2b theory. 
And uh, this is where he originally found that there were a border 10 to the 500 spring vacuum states. But in this case, you'd get a string theory landscape that contains a vast ensemble of n equal one equal four super effective theories at high scales. And the effective field theory should contain the standard model as a weak scale effective theory. The effective field theory contains a visible sector plus potentially large hidden sector. Uh, this is expected in generic string models. And the visible sector contains the MSSM plus possible extra gauge singlets, for instance, a PQ sector and right hand neutrinos. Notice that these gauge singlets are not two gauge singlets. Right hand neutrinos live in the spinner of SO10, and the PQ multiplets contain charge under uh, R, possible R symmetries. And then supergravity is spontaneously broken via the super Higgs mechanism via F or D terms or in general combination. In this case, um, you get from the string theory landscape a favoritism towards large soft breaking terms. It's as easy as this. If you have a single F term breaking, since F is a complex valued field and what matters is the modulus of F, not uh, its particular complex value, then you can imagine here's all the values of uh, F terms that give you one SUSY breaking scale. Here's one that gives you a smaller SUSY breaking scale. If you're a drunkard and you shoot darts at this target, you're much more liable to land in the red annulus than the green one because there's more area in the red annulus. And so this would give you a linear draw towards large soft terms. Basically the soft terms, we can evaluate um, <clears throat> the volume of extra dimensional uh, soft breaking space. And it gives you M soft to the two NF plus ND minus one. For a single F term breaking, then you get M soft to the linear uh, to the power one. And you expect big soft terms instead of salt, small soft terms. So this is what you expect from the string landscape. And if you've got more F terms and more D terms, you get an even stronger draw towards large soft terms, just because there's more volume in the higher soft breaking parameter uh, space. Uh, but you have to combine that selection principle, which you'd think would pull you up to soft terms of the order of the gut scale, uh, with uh, the anthropic condition that the weak scale should uh, not be too large. Um, so uh, actually, the value of the weak scale was addressed by John Donahue and collaborators way back in 1998. They basically posited, suppose the weak scale was not uh, 100 GeV, but maybe it was 500 GeV or 1000 GeV or 10 to the 11 GeV, what would happen? And what would happen they found was a picture that looks like this. Uh, this funny units on the bottom scale basically corresponds to uh, the value of the weak scale. And this white region in the middle with a line down it, uh, <clears throat> shows you our weak scale and the allowed values of weak scales in other pocket universes. And basically, if the weak scale gets too big, then you actually go to the left side of the plot to these funny units, but you get no stable nuclei, the proton neutron mass difference changes. And uh, you won't get complex nuclei, you get all protons or delta plus plus, uh, like uh, nuclei over here, and you won't get atoms as we know them. So this violates what's called the atomic principle that uh, for life as we know it, you have to have atoms. So if we go back to that multiverse with uh, many pocket universes, only those with uh, weak scales that are close to our weak scale within a factor of about two to five from its measured value are allowed. So that actually turns out, uh, one of the big predictions of supersymmetry is actually the magnitude of the weak scale. If we didn't fine tune parameters, if we put in mu and these soft parameters and we calculate MZ in these different pocket universes. And the requirement then from Donahue is that the 
mz in the pocket universe should be within a factor of two to five of its value in our universe. This is really exactly the same as our electroweak naturalness condition. And so the string landscape melds in well with our version of naturalness. So the idea here then is a similar picture to the cosmological constant, the weak scale on a log scale should be around uh, 10 to the minus 16 of the uh, gut scale. Uh, and so uh, if you're, you get too big of a weak scale, then uh, you don't get uh, <clears throat> atoms as we know them. And so uh, you have to combine that anthropic requirement with the draw to large soft terms. So you can do this exercise, you get a picture like this. Here's the A0 soft term versus M0. This is a case where MHU is equal to 1.3 M0. If A0 terms get too big, then you push the top squark soft masses negative and you get charge or color breaking minima in your electroweak potential. If you make M HU too big, then you get no electroweak symmetry breaking. So you have to get pushed up these horns. These arrows show the direction the string landscape is pulling you. Uh, but the red region is where the weak scale is small. And so you're getting pulled up and into the red. This black contour shows you where the Higgs mass gets to be bigger than 123. You're actually getting pulled to a large Higgs mass and up into this red region by the anthropic requirement coupled with the total large soft terms. So this actually gives you a string theory mechanism to generate natural supersymmetry with a Higgs mass of 125 GeV. You can put all this together and make statistical predictions for what the superparticle and Higgs mass is by scanning over the soft terms, but now not uh, doing them uniformly, but as a power law. So you have to generate random numbers uh, linearly or quadratically or what have you, and uh, see what your distributions look like. And if you do that, here's the probability distribution dp by dm Higgs uh, for what the Higgs mass should be. And you can see for the n equal one or n equal two power law draw for large soft terms, we get the Higgs mass indeed pulled up towards a peak of around 125 to 126 GeV. If you didn't have that power law draw and did a usual flat sampling of soft terms, you get the black contour, which generally predicts the Higgs mass more like 118 to 122 to 124 GeV. So this actually gives us a mechanism for why the Higgs mass from string theory should be around 125 GeV. It's sampling towards large soft terms in a greater multiverse of string vacua. Uh, what happens to the gluino mass? The gluino mass is shown here again for the red and blue histograms with the draw to large soft terms. It actually only starts getting big around two TeV and really peaks around three to four to five TeV. So the gluino is typically beyond LHC 14 reach and you'd need a much bigger collider. Alternatively, the LHC uh, search for Galenos has only started to touch the string theory prediction of where Galenos should lie. And from that point of view, it's no surprise that LHC hasn't so far seen a Galeno. What about the top squark? Well, all these uh, n equal one and n equal two are rather insensitive, but they do start getting big for top squarks around one TeV. So again, the current LHC top spark bounds are only starting to probe the allowed parameter space from the string landscape. And it's more likely that you get a top spark in the one to two to two and a half TeV range. <clears throat> so we can understand why top sparks haven't been discovered yet by LHC. And finally, the first and second generation squark masses, they also get pulled up to big values you can see they go up to 20 to 30 TeV, maybe even at 40 TeV for the draw to large soft terms. This uh, softens any or solves any Susie flavor and CP problems. 
This is what Mike Douglas refers to as stringy naturalness. Um, if I look at the same naturalness in the M0 versus M1 half plane, the bigger density of points gives you a more stringy naturalness solution from the string landscape. And this first graph here is for n equal one draw. Uh, here's n equal one over there. If you got a much stronger draw like n equal four, then you get pulled up towards big soft terms even more strongly, provided the weak scale is not pulled up too big. And so you can see under the stringy naturalness, a 3 TV Gruino is actually more natural than a 300 GV Gruino. So this adds a new twist into the whole naturalness picture and is what's called living dangerously by Arcani Hamed et al. And finally, let me say a note on scalar non-degeneracy in the SUSY flavor and CP problem. It used to be regarded as a bad point of supergravity that you got non-universal scalar masses. But now we see that uh, non-universal masses are actually good in the context of the string landscape. Um, analysis of soft terms and flux compactifications tells you that the various soft terms should scan independently in the landscape due to different functional dependencies of the soft terms on the compactified manifold. And uh, while they are correlated in our universe, they uh, scan in the greater multiverse. This is good in that for radiatively driven naturalness, the A terms, the eno masses, and the various scalars are as large as possible, subject to electroweak symmetry breaking and a not too large drive value of the weak scale of M weak around 100 to 350 GeV. On the other hand, much work has been done to avoid the SUSY flavor and CP violating processes that arise from non-degenerate scalars and soft terms phases. So in spite of the expected non-degeneracy in phases, the landscape offers its own solution to the SUSY flavor and CP problem in that the first and second generation scalars get pulled up to the 20 to 40 TV re regime and they're quasi-degenerate, which means that they're not the same mass, but one might be 28 TV, the other might be 31 TV. So they're sort of degenerate and not grossly non-degenerate. That's because the upper bound arises from generation independent two-loop RGEs that pull the first and second generation scalars up to a common upper bound, while the third generation only goes up to about five TV level soft terms in order to keep the weak scale from getting too weak. So this gives a natural solution to the SUSY flavor and CP problem in gravity mediation in the context of a multiverse. So I only have about 10 minutes left. So let me just get to the point of discovering supersymmetry, uh, natural supersymmetry and landscape SUSY at LHC and ILC and then I'll be done. I don't think I have time to discuss dark matter, which in this case turns out to be a mixture of hexeno-like WIMPs and axions, but it's usually mostly axions. Um, <clears throat> Willem de Boer used to like saying that uh, the relic density needs about 100 GV WIMP per coffee cup volume. If you've only got uh, one-tenth of the number of WIMPs and it's mainly axions, then you'd have one WIMP per 10 coffee cup volume and uh, you're much less likely to have detected those WIMPs yet. And so you can evade direct detection bounds. So for us, uh, here's production cross sections at the LHC versus varying gauge genome mass. And uh, the important point is that these top upper cross sections that are at 10 to the three femto barns come from the xeno pair production. Uh, the two charged hexenos, uh, chi one plus minus and chi one zero and chi two zero. Uh, so these guys are dominant. Uh, the Linos are next dominant and the, the Linos are way down here. So you'd actually expect to see hexeno pair production dominantly and then maybe Lino production next. The Lino pairs and top support pairs are sharply dropping. And so um, if you wanna look for these hexenos, uh, 
the heavier hexenol, we call neutralino 2, decays into neutralino 1, LL bar. But uh, since the masses of these two hexenos typically are separated by 5 to 10 GeV, almost all the rest energy of this neutralino goes into the rest mass of the dark matter particle, and you get very soft leptons in the final state. So you'd get a very soft uh, for instance, dimuon plus uh, consequently soft missing ET, which is hard to trigger on. Uh, one way out is to uh, posit that you're going to radiate off a hard initial state radiation, and then these guys will be boosted by their recoil against that initial state radiation, and you'll get a soft opposite sign dilepton plus jet plus missing energy signature from the xeno pair production. Here's the LHC data. These dileptons should be bounded by M neutralino 2 minus M neutralino 1 kinematically. So you'd expect an excess right around here. Well, actually, here's the data. There is a little bit of an excess in the Atlas data, but not enough to claim a discovery yet. And then it peters off down here. So this allows Atlas and CMS to set limits in the M chi 2 versus delta M chi 2 chi 1 plane. Um, and uh, as I said, the well, we'll see the landscape pr prefers you to live down here around 5 to 10 GeV, and um, they're already excluding masses up to around 200 GeV, but this mu parameter, which is roughly M chi 2, can go up to 350 GeV, so there's a lot of parameter space left to be discovered in this channel. If you look at this from the string landscape point of view, the greater density of dots is more stringy natural. And you see that the mass gap between the neutralinos is around 10 GeV, maybe down to 5 GeV in the Mirage mediation model. And uh, that's where you'd like to live. And here are the project current limits from Atlas and projected limits from High Lumi LHC. High Lumi LHC will bite off quite a bit more parameter space, but can't quite do it all. There's still going to be a lot of parameter space out here that is uh, a little bit beyond uh, their reach. But this, we think, is the most lucrative uh, search for supersymmetry at High Lumi LHC, which is the topic of this workshop. Okay, so in this case, supersymmetry should emerge slowly as high luminosity accrues as these uh, soft dilepton plus jet events build up statistics above standard model backgrounds. And uh, this is the shows the type of business you got to do. Now, this is constructing the tau tau mass squared by looking for two leptons plus missing energy and requiring that they reconstruct tau leptons. Those tau leptons give you actually uh, one of the dominant backgrounds, meaning this green curve here. The signal is this orange thing down here. So you got huge backgrounds to overcome, but if you cut out um, everything with invariant mass squared greater than zero, that gets rid of the z goes to tau tau bar peak. And you can do business, you'd expect the signal to turn up like this little red bump against the background shown over here. And in a recent paper, we showed new angular cuts. Here's uh, what happens when you get these dileptons recoiling against a hard gluon, and uh, the tau tau bar background likes to live in these opening angles uh, being around uh, zero. Uh, whereas the signal gets a big spread in these opening angles and uh, using these new angular variables and you can do even better by exploring for soft dileptons and supersymmetry. Um, another thing to look for is of course, usual gluino pair cascades and uh, top score cascade decays. <clears throat> and high Lumi LHC is expected to probe out to 2.8 TeV in the Galeno mass. And we saw that it could range out to 6 TeV. So this will probe part of the parameter space, but not everything. And so uh, 
but you never know where the Bruino mass will be. And uh, furthermore, natural SUSY with light hexenos gives you a distinctive new channel to look for, namely Wino pair production. Uh, here you've got uh, QQ bar annihilation into the heavier chargino, which is now Wino like because the lighter chargino is hexeno like and the heaviest neutralino is Wino-like. This guy can decay into W plus or W minus with equal probability. This guy only decays into W plus. And so half the time you get a same sign die boson. These hexenos at the end of the decay chain give you only soft decay products as I discussed before. And so you get two same sign leptons plus missing energy plus very minimal jet activity. So this is a different signature than usual SUSY where you get same sign dilepton plus lots of jet activity. This channel offers added reach for LHC14 for natural SUSY and is also indicative of Wino pair production follow, followed by decay of xenos and allows you to probe potentially up to uh, gay masses of the uh, order of a PEV scale. So, uh, Curiously enough, Atlas and CMS have not done a dedicated search in this channel. Uh, and so it's good if you develop a simplified model and uh, some grad student looking for a thesis project should do this analysis of Wino pair production into same sign dilepton plus missing energy plus very few jets. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, if anybody out there is an ILC proponent, uh, ILC would be exactly the right machine to build for these light hexenos. They need to be lighter than about uh, 300 GeV. So if you built a machine at around 600 GeV, that would be a hexeno factory as well as a Higgs factory. This shows uh, the blue curve is E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus. And if you pass hexeno pair production threshold, these hexeno pair cross sections shoot up and are comparable to the muon pair production cross section. But the ILC gives you such a clean environment that these light hexenos with soft decay products are no problem. They can easily be seen. Here's a simulation of what they look like. One hex, one charged hexeno decays to QQ bar neutralino and the other decays to L nu. And you can easily see these in the clean environment of the ILC. So that for that reason, we'd like to recommend our Japanese colleagues to go ahead and get their government to build this machine because it could turn out to be a SUSY uh, hexeno factory. Here's another event with a thi electron pair uh, coming off or a dimuon pair coming off in the ILC simulation. So uh, I think I'll stop there and because uh, I've run out of time and uh, I won't address the dark matter question. So let me jump to my conclusions. The dark matter uh, is all allowed and well and good, but it's mainly axions. And um, my conclusions are that the it's time to set aside the old notions of naturalness. There's plenty of parameter space that's natural under the model independent delta electro weak measure. You do get light hexenos and other particle contributions to the weak scale are suppressed. And so top sparks and galenos can live in the multi TV range. Stringy naturalness is what the string landscape prefers. And that actually prefers a draw to large soft terms provided the weak scale is not too big in the multi different pocket universes of the multiverse. Then you predict LHC to see a Higgs of 125 GeV, but as yet no sign of particles. Uh, a three TeV Galeno is more natural than a 300 GeV Galeno. And this sort of picture solves the SUSY flavor and CP problem. And uh, <clears throat> the cosmological moduli problem and dark matter is expected to be a mixture of axions and hexeno like wimps, but mainly axions. So thank you for your attention on this two hour long talk.
Uh, thank you, Harry, uh, for this wonderful elaboration and covering up the so many topics. And now uh, this session is open for the question. So, students, uh, please unmute yourself and you can ask the questions. And also, of course, who are not students. <laughs> So uh, I have one quick question now. It's like uh, sure. this hexino for the ILC. Don't you think uh, if it is really there, the LHC with uh, so ILC will take quite a bit of time. So if it is there, the LHC would get any hints. So I think uh, it will be. Yeah. Um, well, uh, from those reach plots I showed, uh, the LHC can see much of the parameter space, high Lumi LHC can, but not all of it. Um, let's see. Well, here's some plots, for instance. Uh, these blue curves, one is the uh, Atlas projected reach, and the red solid curve is the CMS projected reach for high Lumi LHC. And uh, while they will cover much of the parameter space, uh, some of it leaks out. So, and it'd be nice uh, if you were directly producing these Xenos and could uh, look at them on an event by event level. So that would be a beauty of the ILC. Um, I and uh, I think Japan's got the will to do it. Uh, they're just teetering on whether to make a commitment or not but uh, they should go ahead. This is a huge uh, incentive for them to build such a machine going up to five or 600 GEV. You know, they wanna build a machine as a Higgs factory, um, but LHC is also a great Higgs factory. Uh, but uh, if they built it and discovered that they had a Higgsino factory, that would, uh, you know, that would be revolutionary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very uh, quick and naive question. Uh, so okay. the thing is, uh, for the supersymmetric guard and the the RG, uh, mm -hmm. that is considered to be mostly guided by the MSM running, right? I mean the beta functions uh, for the gauge gauge nodes. I'm talking I'm just focusing on the gauge nodes specifically. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right. Right. So mm -hmm. and you know, so is it uh, possible to invoke you know the intermediate symmetry? Like if you like start with the SO10 like the mm -hmm. party salam or some other intermediate symmetries and you have two or multiple setup of rgs and will that be a good solution to revive some of the parameter space which are ruled out because of this assumption of this one no intermediate scales kind of thing oh yeah i mean there could be uh, additional stuff going on um uh, so yeah you never know how nature is ultimately mm -hmm. constructed and imagine of nature. Mm -hmm. Imagination of nature may be yeah. much greater than our current imagination. What the current trend is, uh, of course, what you ultimately wanna do is embed all this stuff in string theory. Mm -hmm. And the biggest beef with conventional guts is that they usually require these huge Higgs representations yeah. to get the symmetry breaking properly implemented. Mm -hmm. And those huge Higgs representations do not exist in string theory. Mm -hmm. String theory only requires small representations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, the 120s and the 126 dimensional things that yeah. you use to break SO10 mm -hmm. are very hard to accommodate in string theory. Um, and indeed, uh, that's what, uh, you know, we see the standard model. We don't seem to see extra multiplets. Uh, mm -hmm and uh, all these uh, extra pieces, but uh, that could all be wrong. Mm -hmm. And also like, as you were saying that, you know, the higher representations are not very difficult to accommodate them from the string theory. So, like some people have tried also doing, using kind of effective, writing the effective operators itself at the guard scale, like replacing 120, 126 bar by 16 cross 16 kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah, the beautiful thing about string theory is also you can start with uh, some big, well, 
in the case of the E6 gauge group, you can break mm -hmm. symmetries not with Higgs's, but uh, with compactification of extra yes. dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. And that gives you new mechanisms uh, mm -hmm. that avoid those big Higgs representations. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at least the studies of uh, compactified string theory uh, in mm -hmm. the past uh, 10, 20 years have indicated that um, there is a reason for grand unification, mm -hmm. namely that uh, parts of the uh, compactified manifold may uh, obey one gut symmetry or uh, intersection of gut symmetries. And mm -hmm. so you, uh, that naturally explains why you get double and triplet splitting. Uh, yeah. And other features that some multiplets live in gut multiplets and others live in split multiplets, and that commonly occurs in uh, string compactification. So it's yeah. not as big of a problem as it used to be. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some more questions? There are no more hands. Else. Yeah. Well, I was tempted to ask you, uh, can I? Yeah, uh, please, please go ahead. I was tempted to ask about uh, the, the slides that you did not cover. For example, the axiglion side, uh, what are the dark matter prospects with the, uh, the uh, uh, particularly axiglion ones? I mean, can you comment on that? Sorry, what was this signal axiglion, on? Axiglion. Oh, uh, no, there's on no the, the axigluon, but... Uh... There is an axion, and no, I mean in the in the dark matter side, you 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 wanted to, I mean you you did not cover. I mean you skipped because of lack of time. I mean you oh, had yeah. some, sure, yeah. So some, so what are the high luminosity prospects on on that side? That's what I was. Yeah. So yeah. Well, the um, from solving the strong CP problem, and uh, in many cases, the sol solution of the mu problem, then you get an axion <clears throat> that uh, does solve the strong CP problem. Uh, but that axion is extremely weakly coupled. Uh, so you would never see it in a collider experiment, uh, but you might be able to see it in uh, direct axion search experiments such as ADMX. Unfortunately for the supersymmetry case, uh, the axion is even more weakly coupled than you'd expect. I didn't do this slide, but the axion to gluon, glu sorry, axion to photon, photon coupling down at the bottom of this slide here actually normally contains fermions going around the triangle loop, but now it contains hexenos and they come in with an opposite Peche Quinn charge. And so they reduce the coupling making it very hard to search for. Now the hexenos should also make up some of the dark matter, um, but they typically make up about 10% of the dark matter. And so uh, just the fact that they've got a low detection rate and then their relic density is lower than uh, omega h squared equal to 0.1 makes them fall below the current search limits. Here's a slide of the xenon uh, one ton, for instance, it should ultimately, well, here's the 2016 Lux bound, this red line, it cuts off the part of the SUSY, natural SUSY parameter space. Natural SUSY is the green and the blue, uh, but a lump, big lump of it sits below those bounds. And it would really take a N ton uh, noble liquid detector to cover the entire parameter space. But uh, those groups are doing that. So ultimately you should see a WIMP signal, but the axion, even though it makes up the bulk of the dark matter typically is going to uh, probably elude detection. Um, and it's even harder to see these hexeno-like WIMPs by indirect detection because there you have to have WIMP, WIMP annihilation and if two WIMPs are suppressed by one tenth, then you're suppressed by one one hundredth. And so the indirect detection is very difficult in this circumstance. I see. But um, 
uh, as far as seeing this dark matter at colliders, well, you'd be producing the Higginos as part of, they'd make up the missing energy in the soft dilepton signal. So you'd sort of be seeing them, but as part of a uh, visible cross-section. Yeah, so is there any further questions? No, not in this sector, thank you. So any other question from, yeah. It seems there's no other questions. So let's thank Professor uh, Bear uh, for this wonderful collaboration on the supersymmetry. Uh, thank okay, you, Professor thank Bear. You. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.